How's everybody doing? So uh, if, you, if you were here in June, I had some very preliminary findings on the work uh, that I've done for the, uh, on the CRC project. And today I, I have some updates for you. Um, hoping to stay within time, so bear with me. There is a lot of information here to disseminate, and I'm trying to get it down into a very short and very easy to understand presentation here. Is PowerPoint working? Okay. So I wanted to talk a little bit. I've gotten some emails. I got an email from an uh, ODOT employee last night uh, indicating that I was passing myself off as an expert. And I've gotten some other calls lately as to what exactly is a forensic accountant. So I'm going to really try and quickly explain what it is that I do because a lot of people don't understand what it is. Uh, but I'm a CPA, a certified public accountant. And just like doctors who specialize in, you might have a cardiologist, you might have a pediatrician, I, I have specialized in forensic accounting. Um, you don't find uh, that we do tax returns or audits in my office anymore, even though that is my background. Um, in, in my office, I'm often tasked with looking at a, a situation that usually it can be complicated and almost always uh, involves accounting-related issues. And I am called in to basically tell the story of what happens to people's money. And I am, I, uh, am a certified fraud examiner. Basically what that is is sometimes people steal money from other people and they have me come in and figure out what happened to that money. Uh, and I go and testify in court as to what happened. Sometimes people are suing each, over, each other over a contract. And so I might have to walk in and I ha might have to look at this contract and look at the accounting related issues um, and take what might be considered a non-accounting uh, related document and match that up to what happened with the money, what happened in the checkbook, what happened in the accounting records, et cetera. And I've done my work all over the United States, uh, not just here in, in Vancouver. Um, I've testified in other states, Arizona. I've testified in Washington, D.C., in Maryland, and Oregon, in Washington, in federal matters, in state matters, et cetera. In an earlier life, I used to be a governmental auditor. I kind of grew up in a, uh, a regional accounting firm in Central California, and unlike the state of Washington, who has its own auditor's uh, department and, and the state employees audit the agencies of the state, in California, every governmental agency had to hire their own accounting firm to come in and do an audit, and that's what I used to do. And so my professional background is auditing schools, cities, counties, special districts, um, and, and governmental accounting, it, it has some nuances. We, we talk about fund accounting, and so there's buckets of money, and it has to be used for very specific things. Um, if, if federal funding is involved, we had to go in and do a, a, what's called an A133 or a yellow book audit, some very specific um, procedures that we had to do and had to follow. So that's my background, and, and that really helps in a situation like this because I understand fund accounting. I understand uh, how money flows into uh, an organization. And the other thing is, is, as an accountant, I understand what I should be looking at in terms of um, financial statement documents. If you heard me on the radio yesterday, you have probably heard some of the um, personalities asking me questions and me saying, Here's what I can answer, and here's what I can't answer. So what can I do? I can look at documents, I can look at spreadsheets, I can look at financial statements, and I can put all of these pieces together, and I can give an opinion as to what I'm looking at. And I might be able to say, well, this might look questionable, or, or this doesn't make sense to me, or, or here's what this means. But what I cannot do in this situation or in any other situation is to tell you that something is illegal. 
I am not a judge, I'm not a jury, and so I don't have the power, nor do I have the professional, uh, I just, as a professional, am not uh, somebody who can tell you that this is illegal, that this is immoral or fattening or whatever. Um, I can only put together the information. And it does not matter whether who, who hires me. Uh, sometimes I've been hired by uh, somebody who's been accused of stealing millions upon millions of dollars uh, from an organization. And I'll have an attorney who says, just tell me what happened. And a lot of times I have to tell that attorney, you know, this person is in some hot water. You might need to deal with it. So even though I'm hired by the defense, I'm not there to just try and spin it and try and make it be what they want it to be. My job, no matter who hires me, is to be as neutral as possible. And so I just wanted to clear that up. So what's the scope? What have we done? A really quick background. Um, I was hired or approached in early March or April of this year by Mr. Medor, who uh, for the last 12 months or the 12 months prior to that had been asking some questions regarding the CRC project and had been not really getting forthcoming answers. And so right around this period of time, he, was, he received 714 PDF or electronic files containing thousands of pieces of paper in each file. And so he hired me to disseminate these documents. And when I first met Mr. Medor, I said two things. Number one, you know, you're just asking for the wrong documents. We just need to go down to the CRC office and we need to ask for the right documents. And number two, once we get the right documents, I'm sure we'll be able to really tell the story of what happened to the money. And he said that would be great. So Mr. Medor and I, in early April, he and I alone went to the CRC office in Vancouver. And all I really wanted that day was to, to ask for financial statements. And, and being an accountant like me, I like to start at the top, the 30,000 foot level, and then I can work my way down and I can decide which documents I might want to look at. So to make sure that the numbers on those financial statements are supported by source documents. And so when we walked into the office that day, we were met with several, I want to say six or seven people in the CRC office there in Vancouver. And then on the phone were another six or seven people uh, in Olympia. So for David and I, or Mr. Medor and I, the two of us, there was 12 or more representatives from the Washington State Department of Transportation and the CRC. So that day I said, you know, here's what I want to start with. I want to start with a balance sheet, which in a governmental agency is called a statement of net assets. And that basically would tell us, you know, cash and assets and liabilities. And then I asked for a statement of activities, which in the business world is also called an income statement. Revenue and expenses is about as basic as you can get for any governmental agency, uh, for any dry cleaners uh, company. I mean, from the smallest of the small companies to the largest of large, we all have financial statements. And they looked at me and said, Ms. Couch, we are not required to have financial statements, and so we don't have any. And I, they said, we're a project office, you need to understand, we're just running a project. And so I was trying to understand, well, how does your information flow up into Washington State Department of Transportation documents because those have to be audited, those have to have financial statements. They indicated it was really complicated because they had some money from Washington State and some money from Oregon. And I said, okay, so you're a project office, you should be managing the project, so you've got to have some job cost reports. Basically, you've got to know where your funding is, where it's coming from, and then you've got to know where your money's going to, what vendor, what it's for, etc. And they, they looked at me and they said, well, that's kind of difficult. We don't really have anything like that either. So instead, that day, we received quite literally a data dump of thousands of lines of information in an Excel spreadsheet, which, while not ideal, it was actually very helpful to me uh, because you can use that spreadsheet to, to look at, at data in a certain way. That data that day, showed us $108 million had been spent 
on the CRC project. So really quickly, I wanted to go through some of the things I've asked for. Um, that data didn't match up, and I'm going get, to get to it. If you saw my earlier uh, presentation in June, you, note, you, you will probably remember that of that $108 million, we did not know $15 million or, or who or, or how $15 million was spent, meaning of all of that data of $108 million, $15 million had no vendor name. Okay. And so on May 30th, we actually had a follow-up meeting with them in person to talk about the data discrepancies, and they couldn't really answer me. So on May 30th, I basically asked for a couple of things. I wanted some revenue and expenditure information, and I wanted some answers, some specific answers to uh, my data discrepancies. On July 5th, I asked for contractor bids, I asked for contracts, I asked for invoices for 10 major vendors. So very specific um, documents that I'm asking for. And then on August 3rd of this year, I asked for expenditure detailing all of fiscal year 2011 because the, that data dump that they gave me in early April only went through February the 8th. Now, we are, no, we are not allowed to just walk in and ask any governmental agency uh, for any kind of information or documents. Uh, we have to go through a process called a public records request. And so that's what I'm having to do uh, in order to get the documents that I need. And I wanted to read a little bit um, as to what the revised, what the state law says. Um, and there's a very specific process, but I really like this because I think it's really interesting and I don't think very many of us know really what the, the law says. It says, the people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies that serve them. The people in delegating authority do not give their public servants the right to decide what is good for the people to know and what is not good for them to know. The people insist on remaining informed so that they may maintain control over the instruments that they have created. This chapter, this RCW 42.56, shall be liberally construed and its exemptions narrowly construed to promote this public policy. The state of Washington, any time they receive a public records request from a, from a citizen, they have to respond within five days. And in those five days, they have to say, we received your document request. We're going to give you the information now. We're going to deny your information. Or we're going to give you a reasonable period of time as to when you can get that information. And in early on, if you've read the Columbian, you know that they actually were not in compliance with that five-day rule. And in fact, um, those May 30th uh, requests that we sent didn't even come back to us until July. Um, they weren't even acknowledged by them. My July 5th, um, my July 5th re request was not acknowledged by them for 15 days, July 20th. So I'm going to give you a little bit of update on the discrepancies. $15 million, I still don't know where the $15 million has... Um, has gone, um, and I'm going to talk to you about a four-page white paper that they wrote to me, or for me, to explain to me where that money is, or what that, those, those entries are. And then 38 million, I think I reported on, that wasn't coded with a specific purpose, like rent expense, or architectural, or engineering expense. And they did uh, send me a new set of data that had that information in it. It was just a kind of a lost in translation type of thing. But I want to go back to the 15 million because, the, and let me give you a little bit of background. 108 million was spent on this project from inception, which was about July of 05, all the way through February 8th of 2011. 15 million does not have a vendor name, and it has a little entry. It says D slash W, not required. So on May the 30th, I said, please explain to me what this D-W not required is. And they wrote me back on July the 8th, and they actually wrote a white paper for me. 
indicating that this $15 million represented a journal voucher. And they wrote a four-page white paper explaining what a journal voucher is. Explaining a journal voucher or a journal entry to an accountant is like explaining to a dentist how to do a filling. I understand what a journal voucher is. And basically what they're saying here is that unlike payment voucher documents that are used to generate payments to vendors for goods and services and require the use of a vendor name, journal voucher documents are used for expenditure and revenue corrections, transfers of expenditures, or fund transfers. What that means to me is the money was, could have been spent in another fund and and or another project, perhaps correctly, perhaps incorrectly, but that money needs to be uh, allocated or accounted for in the CRC bucket. So that expense had to be moved into that project. So the money was spent somewhere, just not necessarily out of the bucket we were looking at. And so as of right now, um, I still do not know what the, that $15 million represents, who that $15 million was, was paid to. Um, there is some, they said it could be payroll, for example, the payroll for Washington State employees. Um, but I'm, I'm seeing some other codes that make me think it was, some of it was paid to David Evans, some of it was paid for rent. So it does look like uh, expenditures that may have been paid in other funds moved into this fund but still a discrepancy nonetheless. On August 3rd, I said, great, I'm giving them a month. I would like to now take my data and have a whole fiscal year for 2011. And uh, in the original data, um, it only went through February 8th, okay? And I wanted the whole fiscal year, which ended on June the 30th. And so on August the 3rd, I asked for a new data dump for just the fiscal year of 2011. And I received that a couple of weeks later. And when I received that data, I said, great, I'm going to take the July 1st through February 8th data that I have already, and I'm going to take the new data that they sent me for that same period of time, July 1st and February 8th, and I'm going to make sure they reconcile. And then once I know they reconcile, I can take the new stuff from like February 9th through June 30th, put it into my spreadsheet, and now I've got all of the expenditures for the whole project for the last six years. That data for those seven months did not reconcile. And we're off by over a million dollars, and I personally can't figure out why. And it could be that I'm not using the right uh, columns to match up the right data, but it's a discrepancy nonetheless. And so I emailed them back actually within an hour of receiving the data and trying to manipulate it and figuring out what's going on. And I said, your data doesn't reconcile. I did not get a response back from the accountant that I normally have been talking to. I got a response back uh, several days later from a project engineer who was trying to explain to me that the information that he had given me was for a whole fiscal year and that what I had prior didn't include that fiscal year. And I was trying to explain to him that I understood that, that I was just trying to reconcile a certain set of data. And could you please explain to me why that data for those seven months doesn't reconcile? And I'm still waiting 65 days later to get data that includes 2011. I don't have that. I don't have that data dump as of today. So that's where we are on trying to update the total expenditures for this project uh, through the end of June of 2011. One of the things they did give me on July the 8th was, was the funding, and I can see that you can't see this. So. What this is, it shows that $152 million has been allocated to the CRC project. $15 million has come uh, from the Federal Highway Administration. $62 million has come from the Oregon Department of Transportation. And $75 million has come from the Washington State Department of Transportation. So w a couple of things. Um, one is that there's this idea that it's a 
Washington Oregon project. Currently, or Washington funds uh, have been outspent 13 million by 13 million dollars, as opposed to what, what Oregon's put in to the to the pot, so to speak. So I think that's important to know. We did not know that before, um, and the money's coming from all kinds of places: uh, discretionary awards, um, some earmarks. We are getting earmark funds for this project. So $152 million has been allocated. Total expenditures, this is according to their website, are $130,622,247. That's through June of 2011. Again, I cannot corroborate that with the data dump that I have because I don't have it. Um, so. That's per their website. Through June 30th, 2011, um, $130 million has been spent. So they have a bucket of money of 152. They've spent 130. So they've got about $22 million still to, to play with. One of the things that we've received since June um, was an internal audit report. WASHDA, Washington State Department of Transportation, and many big agencies, many large companies, Microsoft, Nike, um, Intel, they all are going to have internal auditors. So just like I have specialized in forensic accounting and other uh, accountants specialize in tax, there are accountants like me who are internal auditors. Okay, And basically, internal auditors are, sub are independent, objective um, people um, that provide consulting designed to add value and improve an organization's operations. If you know about the WorldCom story, Cynthia Cooper was the internal auditor, and she actually uncovered the enormous fraud at WorldCom that unfortunately brought that company down. And the internal auditing provides value to governing bodies and senior management as an objective source of independent advice. Washington State Department of Transportation has an internal auditor, and we received an internal audit dated January the 26th. So I want to talk to you a little bit about this. I didn't I'm, I'm giving you snippets of documents so that you guys understand that I have documents and I'm not just saying things because I can, but really I'm saying things because I have a document that supports that. So on January 26th of 2010, the Washington State Department of Transportation's auditor, Mr. Steve Kent McKinney, issued a report. And um, his report basically included he was doing a test on, on agreements, on contracts, um, on task orders, et cetera. And he included the following regions or offices in their review of these uh, architectural engineering agreements, um, including the Alaska Way Viaduct, the SR520 office, the I-405 office, and the Southwest Region's Columbia River Crossing Project office. So CRC data is included in this audit. What Mr. McKinney finds is that the department had not included language to authorize 4% markup on subconsultant costs in the master agreements, the contracts, or the task orders starting after November 1st, 2006. For agreements in place prior to that date, Washington State Department of Transportation had not included language in subsequent agreement supplements or task order amendments. They found 19 payments that contained a 4% markup in subconsultant costs. What does that mean? What that means is we have a general contractor, and in this case it's David Evans, and I'm going to get in, into that pretty quickly, but David Evans is kind of like the general contractor, right? He's got a guy, the guy that's going to build the house. But he does, he's not going to do the pump plumbing, and he might not do the engineer, or sorry, the, the electrical. So he's going to go out and he's going to get subconsultants to do those pieces of the work. Every time one of those subconsultants issues a bill to the Washington State Department of Transportation, let's say a $100,000 bill, David Evans and Associates bills Washington State 4% on top of that. So instead of paying $100,000 for the service, the Washington State DOT pays $104,000 for the service, okay? 
But what this auditor is saying is that the contracts don't allow for that payment. The David Evans and Associates contract is included in here because I've read it, and it does not talk about this payment. The other item in this Washington State Auditor's findings is that on August 12, 2009, the department discontinued the policy altogether. And then on page 7 of his report, his recommendation to the DOT is that the current master agreement should be supplemented to, to include the cost in the payment terms if management intends to pay the 4% markup. I talked to you about my previous life. Well, also in my previous life, I used to do a lot of contract audits, uh, royalty audits. And, and in those sorts of cases, basically our job is to go in, look at a contract, see how, it was, how the payments were calculated and paid as to what the contract called for. And if there were any discrepancies in that, either, um, for example, my client might have to pay out additional royalty or additional payments because they didn't calculate that correctly, or sometimes they overpaid and we had to claw back that, that information or that money, sorry. This auditor is saying go back and just change your agreement to allow for the payment. Here's what we found for David Evans and Associates because we received al almost all of their invoices. Number one, the master agreement does not allow for this 4% markup. It is not anywhere in the actual contract, okay? And so far, they've paid $1.4 million in 4% markup on subconsultants. And after August 12th of 2009, when this practice was discontinued, they paid $384,366 in 4% markup costs. This is just on one vendor. They have not been responsive with the other nine vendors that I've asked for. And I just, I, I included documents so you understand what I, that I actually have something. So this is a, a May 10th, 2010 um, invoice for $1.9 million. And work element one uh, totals, I think I have a little light here. Ah. Sorry. $113,000 for work element one. And we have labor of 71000 and expenses of 42000 Gosh dang it. Thank you. If you go to work order number one, you can see the first line item there is a 4% markup on a sub for 41000 on this particular invoice. So we have actual documents, actual, uh, we're, we're, we're literally going, some of these David Evans invoices are like 500 pages per invoice, so you have to kind of go through and find the pages that match up and make sure everything reconciles to the payment voucher. So that's what we're looking at. These payments were made. This is real money that went out. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the David Evans and Associates contract because we finally received all parts of it on Tuesday. July the 5th, we asked for these documents. We received them on Tuesday of this week. Nearly 90, I, I think I counted 98 days later to get the contract for the biggest vendor that this project has. What's interesting is that they had given me, um, I will tell you this, they gave me a lots of letters that said, well, we need more time, we need more time, what you're asking for us is really difficult. And so I finally received two disks this week on Tuesday. It's kind of like Christmas in my office when we get new documents. I don't care what case it is. It's always interesting, right? And so we popped the CDs into my computer, and, you know, I, I, they, everything was really nicely and neatly organized. But what I found were that all of these PDF files have dates of March, April, May. These PDF files were created long before July the 5th, long before I even asked for these documents. Yet it took 90 days, 98 days, to physically take those files and put them on a disk and send them. It is a difficult 
task to work through these public records requests um, because we, we are very truly at the mercy of, of them deciding whether or not to comply with the documents that we ask for. Really, hopefully really quickly. So David Evans and Associates, they are the number one vendor on this, on this um, project. I think in February of this year, I had indicated that the Washington State Department of Transportation had paid $79 million to this vendor. And one of the things I wanted to understand was the process. I wanted to understand what did Washington State put out there? And what did they ask for, for for engineering firms to come and and bid on this project? And then I wanted to understand what did that bid look like? And I wanted to follow the contract and all of the change orders all the way through so that I can match that up to the money that's been paid. And we finally on Tuesday received almost everything, or it appears to be everything, for this particular vendor. So I want to get to that. On, on or about February 16th, 2005, Washington State put out what's called a notice to consultants. And this is how they tell people to, hey, hey guys, we, we have a project, come and bid on this project. And I've highlighted, it says the Washington State o, ODOT project team anticipates the total cost of the environmental phase of the CRC project to be in excess of $20 million with an initial agreement to be in excess of $6 million, but the total dollar figure will vary upon project requirements and funding. Okay? I don't, I'm going to be honest. What's, it says in excess of $20 million. It doesn't say in excess of $50 million. It doesn't say in excess of $100 million. It doesn't say in excess of a 20 or $200 million. It says in excess of $2 million. One of the things that was attached to this document is a statement of, of work. And, and on page oh, three or four of that, it, oh, actually page two, it says the Columbia River Crossing currently has $6.9 million authorized. Again, this is dated February of 05, with an additional $2 million being authorized in the 05 federal appropriations. It is anticipated that significantly more funds will be available for the project. A significant challenge for this project is managing the available funding wisely to move forward to move toward delivery of the project while legislative decisions on ultimate funding are pursued. February 2005. This requires that all, all consultants have their bids into the project office by March 23rd of 2005. The only engineering firm to bid was David Evans and Associates. So we do not, there were no other bidders. And what I understand from the state of Washington is that on the major public works project, um, it's not um, a basically a low cost bid. It's basically you have to have certain qualifications to even bring your team to the table. Um, and David Evans and Associates was the only one. On May 15th, 2005, I know this is dated July of 05, but the actual agreement is actually dated in May. Six weeks later, they um, execute a $50 million contract for the CRC project between David Evans and Washington State Department of Transportation. I do not know why it's $50 million. Um, when we have just two months prior a a call for a $20 million project and uh, 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 speaking about the fact that we only had $6 million in funding at that time. I've not made those connections yet, but I can tell you these are the documents that we have in our possession at this time. So on, on, in May of 05, we have a $50 million contract. Something else I want to show you about this contract so that you understand how it works is that one of the exhibits to this contract is the rate schedule. And this really tells the state of Washington and really all of us who have any interest in looking at these numbers how this vendor, David Evans and Associates, is going to bill uh, 
bill for their work. And they list out all the kinds of professionals, principal in charge, quality managers, bridge engineers, hydraulic engineers, etc. And in that left-hand column, which I know is impossible for you to see, they have ranges of salary uh, between, um, you know, on the low end of $25 to the high end of $80. That's the hourly rate for those people, okay? The second or the third column is the overhead rate. The overhead rate says, well, we are an engineering firm or an accounting firm, and then this is pretty typical, right? But we have to cover our overhead. We have rent. We have administrative professionals that work for us. We have to pay for utilities, etc. And so they'll build an overhead rate into their uh, billing <coughs> rates. And in this case, it's 172.82%. The fourth and fifth columns over are the over or the profit, um, the profit. They call it a fee, but basically that's their built-in profit, and they've built in a profit of 31.5 percent. So by the time that $65 is billed to the Washington State Department of Transportation, so every hour for that $65 an hour costs the Washington State Department of Transportation $197.61. And so I just pulled out a couple of examples so you guys understand how this works. So we have a bill, comes, it comes across the desk on April 17th of 07, and total labor, representing man hours, uh, the total cost of that labor for that bill for that month was $91,536.66. The total payment to David Evans for that for that, those man hours was $280,291.35. So that represented $159,000 in overhead and $28,000 in, in profit. And we can see that through all the documents that we have in our office. And I just pulled out another one. So on July 24, 2009, we have total labor of $138,470. Total payment on that same labor was $420,000. The difference being 234,000 in overhead and 43,000 in profit. So we have the 50, we have the $20 million plus statement or call for consultants. 2005, we have a $50 million contract. In 2008, three years later, we have a three-page supplemental agreement that adds $45 million to this contract. So this brings the $50 million contract to $95 million. There is no change order attached to this document. There it just is three pages saying we need more funding. There was a question and answer memo from the project uh, managers, Doug Fico, to the consulting office at Washington State DOT. And he's basically saying, are the proposed services within the scope of the original contract? Yes. What does that mean? It means we're not changing the scope of the work that we're doing. Explain why the services were not included in the terms of the original contract. The services were included, the funding wasn't. Explain what conditions have changed since the award and other applicable information that clearly justifies the decision to amend the contract. We need the additional dollar amount to continue working on the project. So the, the Oregon State Department of Transportation gentlemen who emailed me last night indicated that, um, that sometimes they have to schedule the money. The money doesn't always come in, so they have to schedule it. And so this could be the reason why um, we have a contract without a change order or any you know, additional scope of work. But this $20 million that turned into 50 is now at 95. And then in May 9th of this year, we, the, the contract was extended again so that for an additional $10 million. And so now David Evans and Associates is scheduled to receive $105 million on the project that originally was slated to cost $50 million in 2005. Just Thursday night late, I started going through all the... What they do is they have this big contract, kind of this big pot of money, and then they have all of these tasks that they say they're going to do, and they have 
um, very detailed reports that map out the work they're going to do. And so I tried to map out those tasks to the contract to make sure we've got dollars that are matching up. And I wanted to walk you through a couple of things that I know that um, you'll find interesting. So um, the first task order was to provide scoping of the CRC project. The first column with the numbers in it is the original cost of that task order. Then there will be all kinds of change orders so that the total cost is on the right-hand side. So they originally, um, in, in July of 05, said, we're going to spend $250,000 to scope the project. And basically what they map out is everything that they plan to do, all the studies, how they're going to manage the project, who's going to manage it. And so to, in order to do the work just to scope the project, they say, we need $250,000 for. OK. They had change orders on that work. That work to scope the project cost $300,000. They come back that same period of time, again, July, August of 2005, and this is their wording, not mine. Their wording is to provide services to jumpstart the CRC project. They are going, it's a $100,000 task to jumpstart the project. Again, this was a lot of project management, how we're going to staff the office, et cetera. About six weeks after the initial task order was created, a change order for additional jumpstarting of the project. Those are their words, not mine. A change order of $3.3 million came through. There were a few other change orders for a total of $3.5 million. So for task order A, B, for jumpstarting the project, that cost $3.6 million. Task order AC, we kind of, they start getting into the nitty gritty. Um, they advance the project to refine the purpose and need, to confirm alternatives for the draft environmental impact statement, to provide recommendations on the procurement process. That task order was originally slated to cost $16 million, with change orders were about $16.3 million. Task order AD, another biggie, um, they were going to advance the project through the following key milestones to publish the DEIS. I want you guys to pay attention. Publish the DEIS, prepare the draft and final local, locally preferred alternative, to prepare the application for the new starts funding, and implementation plan for delivery of final design and construction. That was going to cost $23.6 million and with change orders, it was a 23.9. I know this is really boring stuff. Fast forward to project AE. They now realize they need to scope additional work, so they have a really small task order of 75,000 to again scope to do more planning for work that's going to be done. And that's a pretty big task order, number AF. Here's what they're going to do in project AF. They're going to advance the project through the following th key milestones. The IAMP plan, the draft right-of-way plans for the various states, partial design acceptance, the FEIS published, and the record of decision published. The record of decision, folks, is once all the environmental studies are done, it goes to the federal government, they approve and bless it, and the funding starts to come through. The record of decision is the end of the environmental process and sort of that key thing that needs to happen to start building. That task order AF is going to cost $21 million. There are $11.2 million worth of change orders, 26 change orders on this task order, for a total of $32 million. I want to take you back to the column 21, where the 21 million is and point out the, the record of decision. That original cost, if we'd only landed with the original cost, that got us to about $60 million, okay? Um, with change orders, et cetera, that 60 turns into about $72 million to get the project all the way through the record of decision. Task order AG comes along, and they um, actually, this one, they got ARRA money, Americans for Recovery Act money, and they did $100,000 scoping for the 500 interchange here in Washington and the Victory uh, Braid on ramp in Oregon. Okay? Then I found 
task order AH. And I went back to this three times just to make sure that I was not missing the boat. Um, but the description of AH says they are going to advance the project through the DEIS, begin the FEIS and biological activities. And they asked for another 15.8 million with 8 million in change orders. They received $24 million. This does not seem at this point to add up to what they said they were going to do in task AF because AF was going to get us all the way through the record of decision, which means the DEIS is published, the FEIS is done and approved, and the record of decision has gone through. Um, and so AH gives an additional $24.5 million uh, in funds. Then AI, uh, a couple of small ones, AI and AK all have to do with the independent independent bridge review panel support. And I, I, I know you guys have all been reading the newspaper. The governor's put together an independent bridge review panel to take a look at, at, at what they had designed. And the, the CRC or the DEA is saying, hey, we need $700,000 to help coordinate and support the independent review panel. And with the change orders, that support turned into $1.7 million for a total of $103 million. We know we have a bucket of money for this vendor for 105. Uh, so far, uh, with their original task orders and change orders, they're slated uh, at this point to receive $103 million. That's what I have in numbers. We still have a lot of data to get through. We just got it on Tuesday. Um, but this is what we were able to, uh, to, to get through in the last several days. So now what? Well, we're going to continue our analysis on task orders and change orders and uh, determine the vendors that are paid. Because there are vendors that are listed in these task orders that are not listed uh, as the vendors that have been paid uh, per uh, the CRC's website. We're going to continue to seek out critical documents uh, for analysis. And for example, I'd still like to have the expenditure data, uh, that, that electronic data dump for 2011. And we are also looking at the affected properties and what's going on uh, with, with, the, um, with the properties and how that might be, affect the dollars uh, for this project. So I appreciate you handling all of this, this accounting information. And I know all of us are here to answer questions, and I appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs>